This is Joy News Prime with me, Samuel Kojo Brace. Coming up in this bulletin is President Ekufuado sounding the alarm bells of a break away of the African continent from the rest of the world. Throughout history, Africa has taken care of the world. And we believe that it is time that we take care of ourselves if the world is not prepared or willing to solidarize with us. As he accuses rating agencies of doing the bidding of their paymasters. Now, also in this bulletin, will the EC accept defeat in its uh, determination to use the Ghana card as a sole ID document for voter registration following a bipartisan parliamentary position to allow the inclusion of the guarantor system? Also in this bulletin, Inspector General of the Ghana Police Service, Ekofo Dampari, says his office does not intend to pursue an out-of-court settlement with journalist Latif Idrisu. Now, uh, in a special Joy News report, Rwandan President Paul Kagame is questioning the failure of African leaders to fix their countries themselves. Uh, as international experts cite Ghana as classical example of a badly run economy. You learn from the experience of other places who have answered the what in their context. That brings you closer to understand the what in your context. Now the ball is in your court uh, of the EC to allow the guarantee system for vote registration um, or risk an annulment or rejection of the proposed EC's new CI. Now the two sides of the house have for months taken entrenched positions on this uh, thorny matter. The EC has equally remained adamant insisting it will only allow the use of the Ghana card for voter registration. Parliament, in a rare bipartisan move, uh, urged the Electoral Commission to revise its proposed constitutional instrument. Now, uh, uh, we've been gathering more details on this particular matter. Elton Brobe is my colleague here at Joy News. Uh, let's uh, bring him in because we've been uh, keeping tabs on the Electoral Commission. Elton, uh, you have ears and eyes within the Electoral Commission. Uh, what have we been gathering? So, Brace, the information we have is that the Electoral Commission says that they will be issuing a new uh, a press statement uh, within the hour to communicate their position on what they've heard in the media. I remember that before Parliament rose on Friday, uh, we got information that both sides of the House, as the NDC and the MPP, had come to a decision uh, to reject provision in the year to be laid CI, which was seeking to allow only the Ghana card as condition for uh, registration onto the voters register. Now, let me put on record that this particular information as we have it, uh, was at the pre laying level. Basically, this was before a committee of the whole. At no point uh, during last Friday's sitting, in the EC lay an instrument on the floor of parliament. So let's put that on record. So officially the EC can say that they are unaware of any position taken by parliament because officially there was nothing before parliament and parliament cannot link it to any official document constituting a, a CI. So what they have heard in the media, and of course, uh, during their own appearance before the Committee of the Whole and some concerns that were raised by members of parliament is what they want to respond to, uh, uh, you know, going forward. And they are saying that they will, in the coming hours, release a statement that will state the EC's position on the matters that has appeared uh, in the media. But for now, they are saying that uh, officially they've not been told by the clerk of parliament because uh, that, that instrument has yet to be laid on the floor. What came out uh, last Friday, was at a pre laying stage where they had to appear before the special budget of the committee and indeed the committee of the whole, where members of parliament expressed their concerns with the way and manner the EC sought to go about uh, the process of, you know, laying a CI to allow for continuous registration exercise. Now, the EC position is that the Ghana card is the most authentic way of identifying you know, who a Ghanaian is and who is eligible uh, to be registered on the voters register. 
and they are still standing by it as of now. Now, the latest information coming in indicates that the National Education Authority has cleared some backlog, and that is giving the EC some assurance that they are on the right path. Now, it is instructive also to note that the EC is not under any obligation to accept the position of parliament because this is an independent body and they are mandated by law to do what they consider to be right and just in the eyes of the people they serve. And for that reason, uh, they have heard in the media the you know the concerns of some members of parliament. Okay. And once they get an official statement, they will react accordingly. Okay. All right, uh, Elton, grateful to you. Now, a, a former chairman of the EC, Dr. Kodja Farijan, uh, says he disagrees with the position of the EC to use the Ghana card as the sole ID document for identification and wants the EC to rethink this decision or position and also to allow for other forms of identification. We've been joined on the line by Deputy General Secretary of the Opposition, NDC, um, Mustafa Bande, for more reactions on this. Uh, grateful to you for joining us, Bande. Uh, how does the party react to the latest information coming uh, at the back of this particular position of the EC? Hello, Mr. Fabande. So the, uh, the, the, uh, the two sides of parliament have urged the EC to consider uh, the guarantor system as, as a way of uh, helping people register onto the electoral um, uh, role. Uh, we, we've been joined by the Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, Mustafa Bande. Grateful that you've joined us now. How does the party react to this new development on whether or not the EC should use only the Ghana card as a system of, uh, as, a, as a, uh, an ID to then aid people to register onto the electoral roll? Thank you very much. I, I think that, uh, first of all, that would be a miscarriage of justice uh, and argues that undermines the principle of All right. Uh, uh, let's. Uh, we'll be, we apologize for the very poor quality of that call there. Now, moving on to other stories. Now, Inspector General of Police Dr. George Ekufodampari says his office does not intend to pursue an out of court settlement with journalist Latif Idrisu. Now, this was reviewed by a representative of the Attorney General, uh, Nancy Reta Chumesi Esiama. Now, Mr. Sesiyama had in January informed the High Court uh, hearing the case that the Attorney General had asked the police to opt for an out-of-court settlement um, with journalists, uh, you know, to reach an agreement on this. Now, this caused the cause and uh, the case to be put on hold. Now, two months on, the police say it uh, wants their trial to resume. Latifi Dues continues to bear the brunt of that particular incident, my colleague. Uh, uh, but uh, let's bring you a bit on that particular development. The Attorney General had on Monday told the court the police service had been urged to pursue settlement as an option. During cross-examination of Latif Idrisu, however, an attorney at the AG's office had insisted a journalist was not assaulted by any policeman. Mr. Idrisu dismissed the claim and maintained he was beaten by many policemen. Right, so I feel the pains in my head because that's where they use the butt of the gun to hit and my rib and in my right leg and my chest hit your chest too yeah they were hitting me all over so these are the areas you feel pain but generally how are you feeling my neck as well yeah because of the slaps you know on tuesday the attorney nancy rita chumesi siyama told the court she had been instructed to plead for an adjournment while settlement talks are pursued Justice Redu pointed out the case could progress while an attempt is made to reach an agreement. The attorney pleaded for the case to be put on hold. Lawyer for the journalist and the multimedia group Samson Ladi Anyenini told the court his side was not opposed to the idea of settlement. His concern was however the fact that the case had been unduly delayed. Justice Redu urged both sides to pursue the settlement talks without taking an entrenched position. Mr Anyenini pointed out at this stage that certain comments made by the police were problematic. 
He made specific reference to court documents in which the police had claimed the assaulted journalist was not suffering from any medical complication. Justice Redu advised the police to consider getting an independent examiner if necessary. She stressed that settlement is always the best approach. The case has been adjourned to March 16, 2023. The court is to be briefed on the progress of the settlement talks. So that was a report put together by my colleague Joseph Akable. He joins us on the um, via Zoom now with some uh, details to this particular story. Um, Akable, grateful. First, remind me of what exactly the AG's rep had stated in January um, in, in that particular context. And was she communicating the AG's position or that of the police? At that time, the position she was communicating was that of the Attorney General. Mm. In fact, she said that her instructions from the Attorney General were to inform the court that the matter should not proceed and that the AG holds the view that the police should pursue settlement talks. And so in terms of what was being communicated, it was the position of the Attorney General that was communicated to the courts. Mm. Now, do you know whether there was any meeting uh, to attempt to deal with the issue of settlement? Yes, we understand that uh, there was one meeting between uh, lawyers for the multimedia group and Latif Idris. Mm. Then there were other series of meetings between the Attorney General's office and the police administration. In fact, at the meeting between Latif and Multimedia's lawyers and the Attorney General's office, they were informed that they had started engaging with the police administration and they were going to get back to the lawyers for Multimedia and Latif Idris. Then came the meeting that took place uh, that we are told were quite a number of meetings between the police service and the Attorney General's office. Mm, interesting. Now, uh, do we know of the reason or what reason is informing uh, the opting now for a uh, full trial? It's very difficult to tell, except that we know that the AG's office did write to lawyers for the multimedia group and Latif Idris indicating that uh, they have been told that the letter specifically reads, and I quote, says the IGP and the police management board would not want to settle the matter, but would want the trial to proceed. And so that is all it, it, it states. It does not explain in details as to what has informed this new position. And interestingly, about the fact that this time around, the communication is coming from the police, because initially it was the AG that was telling the court that he holds the view that the matter should be settled. And so has informed the police that they should pursue settlement talks. And this time around saying that I've engaged the police and I'm being told by the police that mm -hmm. they do not want to settle, so they want the trial to commence. And so we do not know what special has accounted for the change in this view and why Perhaps the AG is not insisting on that advice that had urged on the police to pursue settlement talks. Uh, how have the lawyers for Latif been reacting to this new development? As far as lead counsel, Samson Ladianyanin is concerned, mm. uh, this is a matter that has taken too long in court. In fact, in January, when this request for the trial to be put on hold was made, he had actually forcefully made the point that uh, this was not the first time that was being attempted. And his fear was that they would put the trial on hold and come after a certain number of months and not much progress will be made in terms of the talks. And so he had wanted the case to proceed. And so once this latest information was put before the courts, he wanted the records to reflect that it wasn't the case that settlement talks had broken down, but rather the record should indicate that it is the police simply communicating that they do not want to settle the matter anymore. So that in the event it comes up again in court for any whatever reason, then that record should bear it out that in the first instance, when they opted to have that engagement, was the police that simply pulled out and not the case that they've tried to meet the, the multimedia group and Latif at arm's length and that has not been successful in terms of the discussions. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's talk about Latif now. Was he in court today? No, he was not present in court. He missed court session last week as well. And the reason being that he's quite unwell. Oh. His health situation has been that of inconsistency. Uh, there appears that he's well and there appears that he's unwell and currently He's going through one of those phases of being unwell. And so his lawyers actually did inform the court that uh, with the trial set to resume, they were making a request to the court to consider opting for video link testimony in the event he's unable to show up in court because there's also the probability that the doctors that attended to him outside the country have requested actually for him to come back for further treatment and he's preparing to undertake that treatment. And so the concern is that in the event he's out of the jurisdiction for treatment or he's in the jurisdiction and well, then the court should be able to put up with the video link for the testimony to be done via that. And the court did grant that request and has indicated its willingness to allow for him to testify via video link. And so the expectation is that some uh, light will come 
soon in terms of expeditiously hearing this matter. Uh, the records will show that Latif was assaulted in March 2018. And so that is how long this particular matter remains outstanding. Grateful to you. Uh, Joseph Akabli is our legal affairs correspondent there. Now, 36, 33 out of the 46 least developed countries are in Africa, despite the abundance of natural resources. Now, the continent is grappling with underdevelopment, debt, poverty, insecurity, unemployment, among others. Now, speaking on uh, elimination of racism and discrimination against uh, people of African descent at the United Nations. President Nana Adodankwe Kufuado accused credit rating agencies uh, of bias. Uh, he said Africa must work to take care of herself uh, if the world is not willing to solidarize with the continent. Credit rating agencies who do the bidding of their masters have done and continue to do a great disservice to African economies in this regard. As African countries, We've decided to move forward with the development of a Pan-African Credit Rating Agency to ensure greater transparency and fairness, as well as the development of sovereign risk pools in order to spread financial risks evenly. Just as we have also established a Pan-African payment system to remove the currency-related cost of trading amongst ourselves under the AFCFTA. My remarks should not be misunderstood to mean that Africa is bracing herself against the rest of the world. Rather, throughout history, Africa has taken care of the world, and we believe that it is time that we take care of ourselves if the world is not prepared or willing to solidarize with us. Africa would therefore forge ahead to ensure that its foreign investments receipts conform to the high ethical standards expected elsewhere, and that Africa is not ripped off finances that she does not have and financing she cannot afford to lose through illicit financial flows. Now, according to the president, the current uh, trend of uh, the structure of global training arrangement does not favor Africa. As we can see, Africa's economic strength and potential are not reflected by the shared benefits of its participation in the global economy. The state of African economies shows a deficiency in global financial and trading arrangements that have been structurally defined to work against Africa and her people. 33 of the 46 least developed countries are on the continent of Africa. We must thus work to ensure a fairer international financial architecture that treats Africa without a racialized bias in accessing credit required for our development, but also in the manner in which our products are granted access to global markets. In this regard, I support the ass assessment of Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who has said that the international financial system is morally bankrupt as it favors rich countries against the less rich. We must put our political weight and intellectual support behind the Secretary's general call for the reform of these institutions that no longer deliver on the promise they held for the expectations of the many, as more countries slide into economic difficulties with further instability ahead. A rearrangement of the structure of the financial architecture should go beyond the international financial institutions. The regulations of the major financial markets would need to be improved to ensure that the interests of big market actors are not served at the expense of weaker players, including during global systemic crises. So how does this play out for the African continent in the international geopolitics arena? Joining us is uh, Dr. Ishmael Hlover, who is an international relations expert, uh, joining us live on Zoom. Now, Doc, I'm grateful for that you could join us. So how will this play out for the African continent in terms of international geopolitics? Uh, good evening and good evening to your viewers. Uh, for the African continent, this is not a new call. This has been a call for some time now, that there's the need to reform, particularly the global credit rating agent, uh, agencies, uh, so that Africa will be able to have access to uh, credit 
in a more reliable and more inclusive way. If you look at the global credit rating agencies, three of them dominate the, the global credit rating, uh, rating agency market, Mundi's, Fitch, and Standard and & Poor's. Mm. And these three credit agencies have continued to put out uh, ratings for African countries that affect their ability to uh, gain access to international capital markets and also uh, service their debts. Now, if you look at some of the uh, ratings that they have done, uh, most of them currently, most of them are unsolicited in the sense that the country they are rating uh, is not calling for them to, to rate it. So, uh, and once these ratings come out, they influence how investors assess a particular economy and their interest in investing in that economy. Mm. And if you look at Africa, from the time that most African countries started um, getting their sovereign credit rating, it seems as if most of them are now ranked uh, worse off than when uh, they were initially uh, starting to be rated. So if you look at the history of most of African uh, countries, their first ratings are quite high. Then subsequently, they keep uh, coming down. Now, so to say that you need uh, an African credit rating agency may be put within the broader context of the attempt to kind of decolonize various uh, institutions, including financial markets, to allow African countries to have uh, um, access to credit in, the, on the, in a more equitable and, and, and inclusive manner. Uh, in terms of global, global, uh, global geopolitics, uh, this, this should be nothing new. It has always been the call for African countries that the global architecture, the finance, political need to be reformed. So it's, it's something that we have said over and over again. But then again, before we say this, we must also put in context that it seems as if it is only when they downgrade us that we have a problem. But when we are upgraded, then we, we portray it as an achievement. Uh, if we are going to take on these uh, rating agencies and ensure that they give us a fair deal, then we must also be concerned at periods where they, they are upgrading us. And of course, they are not without fault. Mm. Of course, okay. if you look at the 20, okay. 20, uh, 2007, 2008 mm. uh, financial mm. crisis, some of them play a role in, in keeping investors investing in the housing market and leading to some of the collapse that we, we saw okay. in, in the U.S. Okay. So, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm, uh, it is... I'm grateful to you, Dr. Hlovo, for joining us with your thoughts there. But let's bring in a financial analyst, uh, Courage Boti, who is a research lead and economist at, G at uh, GCB Capital. Courage, I'm grateful that you could join us here. First, what do you make of this particular decision that uh, Africa is forming its own Pan-African rating agency to rate African con uh, economies? Well, there are merit in the call from the president and, and the many other people that may have spoken about it. And the earlier speaker before me also alluded to it that this is not the first of its kind. But while there are still merits, can we begin to look at these things in more detail? Already there is a rating agency in Africa, an African-owned rating agency in South Africa, who churn out ratings for some banks and some local institutions here and there. The question is, what do Moody's, Fitch, SMP, what would they typically look at in rating a country? They have parameters. Um, they will look at your political stability. They will look at your uh, debt sustainability metrics. They will look at your fiscal position. They will look at your external balances and anything related that measures your ability to afford debt. We do not have the capital, unfortunately, and that is our doing. We must accept that. We export the gold, the cocoa, the crude oil in the form. That means we get close to nothing from them. And those who buy them and process them get all. So your export and incapacity is limited. You do not produce dollars. So if you are issuing sovereign bonds, it is only fair that I assess your ability to generate enough effects to pay me back. And Commercial creditors will look out for their interest. They are not charitable organizations. Even for bilateral creditors who are not necessarily profit-oriented, they don't like it for their monies to go waste. And so if the argument is that the parameters these rating agencies are using to measure us, we do not agree with them, 
that is a different conversation. But let's look at Ghana closely. What has been our history, even from you as a Ghanaian perspective, in terms of economic management, fiscal stability, debt sustainability over the last decade? We've been to the IMF, I think, all through a Tamil's tenor, when we saw some stability was because we are under an IMF program. Uh, Mr. John Mahama had to go back to the IMF to regain some credibility and build the buffers. Uh, this government, with everything we've said about IMF, we are still knocking on the doors of IMF and hoping to get some support from there. There could be caveat to all of these things, but the reality remains that our fiscals and our financial position has not been one that were unfavorable ratings all this while. And so rather than set up a Pan-African rating agency, and I'm not against the idea, mm -hmm. but rather than think of that as a solution to this problem, why not we tackle the problem of uh, uh, fiscal indiscipline? Why not we tackle the problem of low export base and foreign exchange earning capacity? Why not we tackle the issues of political instability that is brought across the continent? Why do we not tackle the many other issues that these rating agencies who typically look at them based on which they give it assigned as the ratings they give. So there may be merit in the call, but I think the onus lies on, as I said, as a continent also to do the right stuff. This is what investors will look at. The people who have the real money, they will look at the ability to pay back their monies. Look at the case in point where but, 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 by but exposing is it, is yourself it your, to Ghana. Is it your argument that a Pan-African rating agency will not necessarily tackle these things you're you are, you are talking about? So if they are going to look at it in the same light, same parameters, and be very firm and fair in their assessment of those parameters, they won't give you significantly different rating from what we have now. That is the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. If an African-based rating agency will do a job and do it well and assess the parameters the way they are, assess the fiscal risk the way they are, mm -hmm. and not add by us, yes, some of the things like political risk, that these foreign guys add so much capital to, you might not see a lot of that because they understand the local context and they are not biased by some of the media reportage here and there. So you can expect some improvement there. But largely on most of the parameters, I think if you are being fair in your assessment, you will look at things in very similar ways, really. So the difference may not be so much. That is the point I'm trying to make. Okay, all right. Courage, I'm grateful to you for joining us here. Courage Boti is a lead researcher and economist with the GCB Capital. You're still watching Join News Prime. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back with more. Stay with us. Welcome back from the break. Now, 51 accused persons believed to be behind the attack on the Benso operational site of the Golden Star Wasa Limited have been remanded into police in police custody. Now, the suspects are believed to be the ones who led the attack that saw many properties of the mining company and its contractors being burnt. The uh, court, uh, the Takwa Court B, the, the High Court B, Takwa presided over by his lordship Isaac Oseyasari. Um, accepted a plea of the prosecution for an adjournment of the case. Now, the group corporate affairs manager of the um, uh, Golden Star Wars Limited, Gerard Bwachi, joins us uh, in uh, on Zoom now with some details because he was in court today. Gerard, grateful for you to join us here. Now, what was the argument of the prosecutor uh, when the case was called today? Uh, just, a, just a correction, um, um, uh, Mr. Brace. It's... Uh, is a district court B. Okay. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Okay. Thanks for that correction. Thanks for that correction. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the the argument, the prosecutor. I mean, we're happy with the proceedings because it's also um, for us. It was done fairly because mm -hmm. they were quite concerned about the rights of the of the accused, and it was mainly because a group of. Um, a suspect were arrested much earlier and in the process of the investigations led to the arrest of some others and three sets three other sets 
And so the prosecutor were requesting time from the judge, was explaining that it was during the investigations, which is incomplete, uh, that led to the arrest of these other people. So they just need a bit more time to understand exactly who was involved, who was not involved, who was led to the arrest of who and everything, mm -hmm. which I think was fair. Okay. So the chart. The judge saying that they would he would give his ruling on the 14, but expects the investigations to be completed by then because the uh, the accused person's lawyers also also actually brought out counter arguments which and and quoted certain cases which the judges had to the judge had to sorry also look on to be mm. fair to him had to had to go and read it and research it so mm. basically it was adjourned to the 14th okay for so, ruling but also to give time for. Um, so, so on the fourteenth is that when the case will be opened, or that is when the court will be given his judgment? Because the case has not been opened, isn't it? There is, there is a ruling to be had on the, uh, uh, the request for um, um, time for investigation. I understand. My understanding is that that is when the judge will give his ruling on the request for. Uh, extension of time by the prosecution okay but, but but that's the same period that the sort of the, the prosecution needed to complete the investigation so i'm expecting from my layman's mind mm. expecting that okay hopefully by then it will be complete so what does this mean to the company's you know operations or it attempt to revive that 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 site well the, i would like to use the opportunity to, to clarify that I mean, yes, the cost has been heavy, the loss has been heavy and massive, but that has not affected the company's operations, or let's say production that much. It has affected our Benso operations. You see, there's a difference between our operations and our total production. So it has affected the Benso operation. There's nothing going on in Benso, especially because investigations are still going on. Oh, okay. All right. But if you say the company, the company, the company hasn't come to a standstill. Okay. All right. If, if you understand what I'm I, saying, I, yes. the what the, the operation is going on, and well, we have an underground operation which is has totally been unaffected. Mm. It's still going on as usual. Nothing has changed. All right. Production is ongoing. Yeah. Great so for for joining the us. The potential uh, operation uh, has mm. gone down. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Gerard Boache is Group Corporate Affairs Manager of the uh, Golden Star Wasa Limited. Now, Ghana's economy uh, was at a point in time uh, one of the most celebrated in Africa, but that is no more. Now, Ghana is being cited as a classic example of a badly run economy with lessons for the rest of the continent on how to run an economy. Head of our political desk here at Joy News, Evans Mensah, has been in Rwanda in the last few days uh, as guest of President Paul Kagame's uh, governing party as they mark their 35th anniversary. Now, uh, he reports that Ghana is getting some attention for all the wrong reasons uh, from international experts discussing African policy at the governing party's international conference. A succinct diagnosis of the African challenge by President Paul Kagame. And the President Kagame, Rwanda, has risen from a country ravaged by genocide when 800,000 people were slaughtered just 29 years ago to become a country now ranked first on the continent and amongst the top 10 fastest growing economies in the world pre- and post-COVID-19, according to the African Development Bank. His Rwandan Patriotic Front Party, RPF, was created by a group of Rwandese in exile who fought to end the genocide. This week, the party turns 35. At an international conference to mark the anniversary, the party focused exclusively on policy and not politics, inviting international experts to discuss the African problem and propose solutions. What was fascinating was how the international panel of experts openly challenged President Kagame at his own party conference in a healthy exchange of ideas. It started when the former president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Donald Kabiruka, suggested that Africa's challenge was mainly failure to properly diagnose our problems and apply the right solutions. Uh, before you answer how, you have to answer what? And I'm not even sure that you have answered the what. 
So let me give you an example. So we now talk about the energy transition, uh, which we depend a lot on a number of minerals, maybe there are three or four, I think. And are you certain that countries owning those minerals are not going to make the mistake which countries exporting oil and gas have not made? I'm not sure about that. So if we're going to say this is how we do something, but what are you doing in the first place? So how do I put this to you? Every single country in Africa I visited, and I visited all of them except one, has a strategy. 30 year strategy, 40 year strategy. All right? You are right. What they fail is on implementation. But often it is because the what itself has not been well thought out. All right? So it is important to answer how, but you must also answer what are you going to do. I'm not certain that many countries, the what has been answered. President Kagami, in his front row seat, raised his hand, appealed to speak, and disagreed. We've been places, all of us, and we've been in search of what is it that we can do in Africa transformation journey on track as we wish to. Here the problem uh, which Donald talked about also is that implementation. It's actually the main issue. Uh, you said that you are not saying that there are no implementation issues. Actually, this is the problem. Forget about the how or the what. The how and the what have been answered by you even now on the sitting there in the panel. They have been answered before several times for years. It comes to doing things, we either do nothing or do the wrong things. The expert panel stood their ground. Professor at Harvard University, Dr. Celestine Monga, insisted their position on the matter was the right one. I would still dare say that I'm on the side of Dr. Kaberuka on this one, simply because, yes, we've seen solutions, we've heard ideas at conferences, but many times we also have wrong ideas in the books and we implement the wrong ideas. Um, so I still think that in some questions, the what is still relevant? What should we do? What should we not do? I see in many African countries, I was very happy among uh, many nice jobs that I had. Uh, one of the most meaningful was to be chief economist, vice president of the African Development Bank, because it was for me really the opportunity to serve the continent. Um, I had uh, bigger jobs before that, but that one was so far to me the most meaningful. And I could tell you, Mr. President, that I had interaction with a lot of ministers and prime ministers and president who believe in the wrong ideas. So I think that the what in some situations is still relevant. President Kagame will not give in, making another comeback calling out African countries for either doing nothing about their problems or doing the wrong things. Because we're asking, us, we're asking the what of two kinds. What do we have to do ourselves? Rwanda, the continent. And then there is the what that has been answered in other places by other people to get to where they are that we want to be. So, of course, countries have different contexts. But this does not preclude the point I'm, I'm trying to make. Then you, you learn from the experience 
of other places who have answered the what in their context, that brings you closer to understand the what in your context. So that's a report by Evans Mensah. He joins us via Zoom now with uh, details or some update from this particular conference. Uh, Evans, uh, great to see you there. Thanks for joining us live from Kigali. So what more have been said at this particular international conference? Well, so uh, towards the end of it, the subject of uh, particular African countries and how they're running their economy, the best and worst cases, and, and Ghana came up, the um, former president of the AFDB uh, made the point, and, but he was very careful not to say, not to mention anybody's name, but he says, well, he keep on repeating, I'm not mentioning anybody's name, but it was very clear when he talks about um, the, the West African country that had gone back to the IMF, and I mean, clearly, Ghana currently is the only West African country that has formally submitted itself to an IMF program. We are looking forward to getting it. I mean, so, so it was very obvious okay. uh, which, which country he was talking about. And then as a Ghanaian sitting in the audience listening to that, you, you have to eat humble pie. There's a bit of pride that has been pricked, but you have to eat humble pie. I mean, if you look at the data and the statistics, it, it's very clear that where Rwanda is today from where they were in 1994, at the time of the genocide, where almost a million people were killed, to now, uh, like this is 29 years. Mm. They have done tremendously. And, and the difference with, with here, and economically, I mean, as a socioeconomic advances in Ghana is that the last 10 years, they have done this systematically, continuously, sustainably over a period. Mm. What we have had is brief moments of, of boom, followed by a long period of bust. So in, in 2014, Ghana was a fastest growing economy in the world. In fact, they, they, the country with the highest GDP, 14% of or so. And then thereafter, I think it was something 2011 because of oil and, and see where we are today. And shortly thereafter, the NDC government went to the IMF and then we came to the MPP administration where in the early years we're doing well. And then all of a sudden, we are back. That is the difference between us and Rwanda. They mm -hmm. set on this path and they've been on this path consistently over a period of 10 years and, and see where they are today. And for me, that was fascinating. But again, um, uh, just briefly, another thing that, that, that caught my attention mm -hmm. was the fact that this is a party conference where you, you definitely have the leader sit there and get challenged by an international panel of experts. Mm. And mm. the party chose to focus more on, on, the, on the policy and not the politics. And I thought that they're definitely something that we should be looking at mm. emulating. Mm. In just some 30 seconds, what do you think uh, Rwanda is doing right that if Ghana is able to do same, probably we may reverse uh, the trend we are on now? And I, I, when, when this question is asked of me, I, I want to shy away from the uh, cliches. Everybody will say, oh, they, I mean, they're focused on industrialization and et cetera. Those are cliches. Everybody knows that. And Pokagami makes the point. The hows and the what we know, we've been told. And what, where I depart is, to answer your question, mm. one of the important things I've noticed is if you fix the political parties that form the government, you invariably will have will fix the government because the political parties in a democracy, they form the government. Mm -hmm. If the party is in discipline, those, that party will form a government and that government will be an indisciplined government. Do you know what indisciplined government produce? Indisciplined government produce a poor, corrupt country because the people who are running it from the political party, they themselves are indisciplined. So I've come to the conclusion sitting in the party conference that where the policy was the focus and there was a lot of discipline that fix our fix NDC and MPP mm. and, and let them believe in meritocracy okay. so that when they become they form the government they will implement those same discipline principles in running the government that's the only way I believe we will possibly um, start making a sustainable uh, sustained development over the period okay all right Evans uh, keep enjoying Kigali we'll be back to you sometime tomorrow grateful that you could join us there so that's Evans Mensah head of political desk here I join you live from Kigali in Rwanda. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back with Showbiz with Becky.
All right, so time for us to bring you showbiz and Becky Bex is in the house. Hi, Becky. Hello to you, Brace. How you doing? I won't talk too much today because, you know, I have a very special you have, guest. You have, a, you have a lot to share. No, I have a very special guest who is watching, David. David Mensah, thank you so much for oh. watching. Oh, uh, who's David Mensah then, by the way? He's my senior brother. Okay. Yeah, let's congratulate. Senior brother, yeah. Let's congratulate uh, Harold Amenya. Uh, he got married uh, over the weekend. Uh, it was a beautiful ceremony. Yes, uh, so that's, that's Harold. Um, and this one, some right. people think that if they buy one megabyte of data, mm. they can sit on social media and say whatever they like to a, a guy like that. Yeah. Someone has made his choice. Right. And he's not complaining. But you sit in the corner of, I'm sure, some rusty rooms. Right. And you talk. We are on TV, so I, I cannot say something. But you, see, you read some of the things and you're like, how dare them? This is what Who social. I mean, this is what social media, you know, oh. has done to you know all of us. I I, I don't know why people mm. are so mean to each other, but please spread the love if you have the chance in your life. Uh, please spread the love. But uh, I mean, speaking uh, of uh, Harold, Harold mm. I had a conversation with him, mm. and he's been talking about being in the limelight. Here is what Harold. I live a very normal life. I think I live a very, very normal life. Um, also, I think it's because I like to do everything myself. I don't like people doing stuff for me. So I do everything myself, which means that you live a very normal life, which means that you catch me buying my watch, you catch me buying my cocoa and kose. I do that. So um, I live a very normal life. So I really don't know what it means to be a celebrity. I only dress up and show up at events, if that's what it means. I think that's what I do that makes me look like a celebrity or well, makes you, me a celebrity. Uh, as a public figure, how, how do you, you know, live your life? So, so to be able to survive um, under the spotlight, you need a lot of uh, mental fortitude. Okay, you need to be mentally strong. Um, in the sense that, you, you know, you're not moved by, of course, it's good to have compliments, it's good to have fans, it's good to have people shout praises on you, but guess what? If that gets to your head, then trust me, their, their criticisms and their negative comments are also going to get to you. So it's very good to have a, very, a balance and also be mentally strong so that you can, you know, regardless of what the situation is, whether it's compliment or not, you can still stay afloat. I'm sure he's staying afloat yeah. regardless. Mm -hmm. and uh, he's, you know, doing all the balancing where it needs to be balanced. Let's uh, talk about Prince Bright. Prince Bright mm -hmm. uh, says that uh, he will be releasing a collection very soon. It's actually a fashion brand, Roots Africa Collection. And he says that it's something that you should look forward to. This is, this is actually Roots Collection. is a luxury line that's coming out this fall. Um, never forget where you're coming from. You see the African knot behind mm. And the lettering is right in right where Ghana, the Ghana market. Yeah, right here. Exactly. Yeah. So that comes to say, I don't forget. I well, you're am coming a from. Ghanaian first before turning American. You know, and um, yes. So this is Roots Collection. Okay. How um, how how long did you start? You know, the whole collection. It's uh, been about. It's been about three years ago. Okay. You know, we started very, very small. Now it's really gotten bigger because we are connecting to other, you know, business partners to be able to move it to a, a bigger market. Yeah. We actually in the in a you know, we're doing some few things to get it where where it's supposed to be. Okay. So I'll keep a lid on that for now. Okay. But that Prince Bright, right there. We're yeah. definitely looking forward to that. that but. Uh, mm -hmm. Brace, before we go, let's talk about uh, cues and lyrics. So the audition happened at the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, here's all you missed. <laughs> Praise the Lord Amen. Jesus Christ. Ah, fire. Hungry and thirsty for stardom, they've traveled far and wide in their quest to fulfill their music dreams. Hundreds of these burdened musicians throng the maiden audition of cues and lyrics. Dreams never chase man, man chase dreams. Yeah, so I'm here to chase my dreams and make my region proud. Their preparations at home were just not enough. From the lounge to the washroom, these young musicians dotting their I's and crossing the T's before facing the judges. 
The judges, Mix Mr. Ghazi and Fortune Dean, were on the hunt for talents with originality. We have new genius, you know, coming in as in the alphabet, and then people are, you know, being creative. So it will be tough today, but trust me, we are going to get the, the star that we want. I'm looking for something very different from what I usually hear. One after the other, each contestant stepped onto the stage to determine their fate. All music journeys were represented from rap, dancehall, Afrobeat, R&B, hip hop, gospel, and reggae, among others. Me start to investigate and a man who played things at the apron. Your side I beg God and articulate. I there I mix it B B R together. I a raga can cry and sing and I mix it. Nyama nyama B na ade. Cause we are young, ah, we carry on, ah. Oh my God, I bet you are feeling this song, ah. Would it die when they call me home? Danny now, who bought me home by? Won't pin me, my own son for me, and I'm honest. Whoever is there, if they've picked anyone, just try uh, a song.